of, of memorabilia of books and, and, and photographs in the North jury room. So if you, so instead of just anticipating, if you, if you feel like milling around, it would be, it would be a pleasure. Let me, uh, let me welcome you to this evening in celebration of the memory of Sir James Richards. My name is Alan Balfour, I'm the chairman of the AA. The thought for this evening came from the council, from John Pringle and Rogers Golovich, wanting to celebrate the memory of a man who had meant so much to estab establishing the project of modernism in Britain. And we have to thank Lady Richards, Richard and Victoria Gibson, Sir James' son-in-law and daughter, John Pringle and Penny Richards, and Peter Davy of the Architectural Review, and Mark Prizman and his students for, uh, for making all that will happen this evening possible. And let me turn over to our moderator, Mark Gerouard. Mark. Of course, uh, one just can't help thinking, uh, looking round the room this evening, how much Jim would have loved this party and seeing all his friends gathered here together. <coughs> and in his absence, we're just going to have to do the best we can to get pleasure out of thinking about him and talking about him, and in doing so, to express our admiration and affection for him. Uh, in that room at the back there, we, we put together a little exhibition w w which tries, however superficially, uh, to give some idea uh, of the width and variety of Jim's life and interests and achievement. Uh, and now a, a small group of his many, from amongst his many friends, um, are going to talk about him, uh, in addition to those who were named on the invitation card, that, that there's also going to be a contribution from John Pringle, who, uh, with his uh, parents, were such good and close friends to Jim and Kit over so many years. And after that, there's going to be a, be uh, a brief pause, uh, and then uh, there's a, 
uh, surprise, a little surprise uh, celebration arranged uh, to end up, uh, the nature of which it's just possible uh, you might be able to guess uh, on this particular evening. Uh, um, well, Jim uh, didn't believe in an afterlife, and nor do I, but I do think that people live on in a very real way in their works and in the memories that those who knew them had of them. And certainly uh, my memories of Jim are very, very vivid. And this in spite of the fact uh, that he was the least flamboyant of people. He was just somehow so very, very solidly, absolutely himself and real. I was touched and amused uh, by the photograph of Jim aged six, which is reproduced in his autobiography and is also in the exhibition there, uh, because there, not even in embryo, is already the, the Jim I knew, that sturdy, serious, slightly serious little boy, um, a bit on the heavy side, uh, standing four square to the world. And I always remember with the greatest pleasure uh, our arrivals at the flat in Fawcett Street and how we would ring the bell and stand outside and gaze through the window at the stairs going up to the flat on the first floor and first wait a bit and first of all Jim's feet would appear in the inevitable striped socks uh, <laughs> and then the rest of him would come rather slowly down the stairs and the door would open uh, and he would welcome one in courteous and slightly formal style and very often would say how extremely good of one it was to come all that way. A, a, a kind of modesty that I sometimes found a bit embarrassing but I don't think it, it was mock modesty at all. Um, Jim was uh, knew what he was good at. Uh, he had no doubts about that at all uh, but uh, he didn't value his skills all that highly. Um, I would say that he undervalued them. He didn't realize uh, how uh, superlative they were. Because uh, he was indeed uh, supremely competent, well-organized, and disciplined. It wasn't just as an editor, um, as, as which he was, of course, superbly, and I think proudly, uh, professional. Um, but it was in everyday life as well. Um, I think it's typical of Jim uh, that unlike most men, and I think I can say unlike Kit, uh, he enjoyed doing the household shopping. It was he who always did it, and he did it uh, with the greatest competence, skill, and pleasure. Um, and I, always, I, I also like to think of Jim um, when he decided that he must lose some weight and say so what he did was either every week or every month, I forget which, for one day uh, he just ate nothing at all. And he did that with total self-discipline until the necessary amount of weight had been lost and then he started eating again. <laughs> um, it's also... Um, since he's died that I've appreciated more than ever um, how um, extraordinarily uh, well organized uh, he was. It's been a humbling experience to someone um, as uh, haphazard uh, uh, as I am to uh, be involved a bit in going through his papers and books and see uh, how met meticulously well they were arranged and how he didn't, like so many people, um, shuffle out of life in a mess, but left everything well thought out before. The long letter of instructions as to what Kit should do after he died is somehow both moving and funny and impressive because he had thought of everything in such detail, so competently, uh, so well in advance. But of course, we didn't only value Jim because he was competent, well-organized, and reliable. We valued him because he was honorable, because he was kind, 
because of the width and variety of his interests and because of his sense of humour, his sense of quality and his sense of style. How honourable and how kind he was, there's no need to talk about it really because we, his friends, all know it. His sense of humour was never dazzling or ebullient because that's not the kind of person he was, but it was very real. And it makes, for instance, uh, reading his autobiography a constant pleasure. His wide interests and huge range of contacts is really quite remarkable. And it's that combined with his professionalism that made the review at once uh, so influential and so enjoyable. Uh, I've been looking through his address book and it really is the most amazing and invaluable uh, list of contacts all the way around the world. Uh, he valued his friendship with architects but I think possibly even more with artists. He had this terrific respect and fondness for creative people. I think partly because he thought of, rather humbly of himself as a professional uh, but not a creative man. And I don't think he realized how his uh, act of creation was actually uh, the review itself. His interests were never narrow. Uh, we all know how he was closely he was involved in the modern movement uh, and in the uh, 1930s particularly with the um, socialist left-wing um, enthusiasms which so took up um, young men of his generation uh, but the doctrinaire side both of the modern movement and of uh, socialism uh, never appealed to him uh, he, I think he always put uh, human beings first and his interests stretched far beyond a sort of narrow searchlight on architecture, let alone any particular uh, way of architecture. And that, I think, expressed itself in his flat, where there were so many, uh, you know, his interests in pubs, his interests in um, semi-detached villas, uh, his interest in jubilee mugs, uh, uh, um, the, the, the sort of odd things that he picked up in the Middle East uh, were all there as an expression of his personality and his range of interests. His sense of quality was epitomized in the uh, skill and perception with which he recruited uh, staff and um, contributors to the review. Uh, one thinks, of course, of Nicholas Pevsner and Peter Bannum and perhaps um, Robert Barron, but of masses of other people and many people um, who are here this evening. His sense of style, well I think in a, in a typically sort of um, unstressed way, uh, Jim was a bit of a dandy. Uh, and I always think with affection of his striped socks, uh, the one little bit of uh, flamboyance stylish flamboyance, however partly concealed, uh, which he allowed himself. And in fact, um, in his memory, I'm, I'm wearing striped socks <laughs> tonight. Uh, they were a, a, a present from my daughter. I would dearly have loved to get hold of some of Jim's own striped socks, and I did in fact make a bid for them, but I discovered that they'd all been taken up immediately uh, by his family. <laughs> And I like to think of them uh, going up to the um, um, northern islands of Scotland uh, and perhaps being used by his daughter Victoria in her um, knitting industry, if that still goes on, I'm not quite sure, as models uh, so that um, Jim's striped socks will uh, continue to shine on by the hundred uh, in those northern seas. Uh, but, of course, we don't need the warmth, the glitter of, of striped socks uh, to maintain the warmth uh, which we all feel for Jim in our hearts.
So I'd like to say a few words um, <coughs> of the situation which would, affected, which would have affected Jim in the very early days. The days when he was at this academy, the Architectural Association, and he would have confronted, I'm sure, E.A.A. A. Rouse and... What? E.A.A. A. Rouse? He would have contact or been in contact with the principal E.A.A. A. Rouse who would have given him the same kind of shock that he gave me, that architecture was not about style, it was about people, it was about a commitment to society, improving that situation through design and technology. Above all, he reiterated time and time again that it was nothing to do with style. Jim would have been spellbound by the first reading of Versian Architecture towards an architecture, a book which you all know, but which was wrongly translated in its title as towards a new architecture. The word new was never in the original uh, edition. At the time that he finished his studies, Wells Coates would have been crossing the channel to be in touch with Corbusier, Gideon, and the founding fathers of the modern movement to understand the debate that was going on in post-war Europe. And at that time, Lubetkin would have been crossing the channel the other way to bring the debate to this country. During the period, roughly speaking, of the last five or six years before the war. Jim was editor of the Architectural Review and he worked very closely with a figure called Morton Shand, one of the most precise writers about architecture, modern architecture, so precise that he was known in the trade as point oh oh one. Very shortly after that, um, Jim invited Corbusier to come to England and to write about Lubetkin's High Point One. And Corbusier, not overknown for his modesty, did an extremely good piece, but spent most of the time looking at the Crystal Palace before it was burnt down. And a last episode in the 30s was a very strange one it was about something called the Vigilantes. And the Vigilantes was the concoction of the Architects' Journal at the time, who asked people they thought would have some judgment of architecture to put down the buildings that they thought were the most interesting at that time. The names I think you'll find interesting. Betjeman, Kenneth Clark, Julian Huxley, Rebecca West, Corder, Charles Lawton, Lowe, the cartoonist, Henry Moore, Piper, Herbert Reed, and many others. Now, I mention this because in the voting, Tecton and Lubetkin got 26 votes in this poll. Um, Adams, Holden, Pearson, 17. Crabtree, Slater, Mobley, 15, Sir Giles, Gilbert, Scott, 10, Mendelssohn and Shemayev, 9, Maxwell, Fry, Owen, Williams, 5, and yours truly, in the company of Lutchins, 3. <laughs> the reason that I have mentioned this is because Jim and I first made contact in the Architectural Review number in which he published my Paddington House. And I only mention it for certain reasons. I was then made aware through this publication of Jim's wonderfully presented pages, typography, photography, and layout. Also, I want to make the point that when you're a very, very young, inexperienced architect and a major organ like the Architectural Review
publishes your work, it produces a debt of great gratitude, of encouragement which Jim gave to not only me, but all my generation. By this time, of course, to use um, Harold Nicholson's words, the lights were going out all over Europe, but not before, in these five years, not before the Architectural Review had established itself as the mouthpiece of the modern movement. After the war, he joined in the 1940s. He was a very active member of the international conferences like CM, and I was with him at X, the CM Ninth Conference. These were conferences which were sort of meeting points to discuss ideas in general, in general terms, a lot of pontification which he wouldn't have liked. But what was central at that particular meeting was a building which we went to celebrate. You might call it a multi-story monastery, but it was in fact the Unité d'Habitation en Corbusier. This was a building in the period 47 to 53, which encapsulated the transition of the hopes of, a, of one post-war generation to the cynicism and disappointment of another. But the point that stays in my mind at this gathering of architects was a little conversation that I had with Jim at the time, who was very taken with Corbusier, having for a time had a certain amount of resistance. And he was very taken because on two previous occasions, Corbusier had shown himself extremely interested and sensitive to old buildings. And I said to Jim, I don't know why you're so surprised. I, who met Corbusier more than once in his studio, noted that he always had a postcard of the Parthenon on his mantelpiece. Very shortly after the CM meetings, we have the Festival of Britain. These are episodes in which Jim was very much involved. This was masterminded by Casson, signaled by Paul and Moyer Skylon, given form and body by Tubbs, Fry, Cadbury Brown, Architects Co. Partnership and Spence. And about it, Jim wrote, it was the physical embodiment of the townscape policy of the architectural review. Non-monumental, non-axial, informal spaces, and changes in level. We come now to 1950s, 54 to be precise, when Jim married Kit, and I got married, and we used to go to parties. This is the beginning of my closer friendship with Jim, and these parties were given by Wells Coates in his flat in Yeoman's Row. Wells Coates was a superlative cook, and his party is extremely convivial. Mark has referred to the many things that Jim was interested in, in the arts. The culinary one was not one of them. And as a result, Julian and Mary Trevelyan had to write a book called Jim's Cookbook. <laughs> and it contained one of the recipes was a cheese dream and in due course they received a telegram saying I have managed to make a cheese dream <laughs> uh, Mark has touched on the many many luminaries, luminaries that a great editor would have anyhow surrounded himself with Pevsner, Englishness of English Architecture, Bannon the single most important new critical voice. I went to a lecture in this building with him and uh, Pevsner banging on about something or other. <laughs> and uh, I remember one phrase. He invited Vitruvius to go home. <laughs> Nairn, Outrage and Subtopia and others like McCullum, Nicholas Taylor, Siobhan, County Casino, Gordon Cullen and his marvellous drawings, Betjeman, Osbert Langston, Summerson, Amory, Kenneth Brown, Peter Davy, and I'm sure I've missed out some. Most of the buildings glamorized by the pictures, photographs of Dellen Wainwright. And hovering over this galaxy was a shadowy figure, H. to C. de Cronin Hastings, about whom Jim wrote about his enormous influence 
<coughs> on all matters environmental. If I try to think what were the two <coughs> missions, and I probably got them wrong, that were at the back of Jim's mind during an amazing editorship which lasted 40 years. I think he wanted to encourage a way of building which sprang from the time and the people and which would have been inspired by the greatest masters of the past and of the present. That would be the first one. And the second one would be to try and stop the rot which the 60s witnessed in the destruction of the historical fabric of our cities and our landscape. And as Marx said, by this time, the Architectural Review was not only a mouthpiece, it was the most important organ of architectural magazines in the world. It was masterminded by a, a, a trio. <coughs> In many ways, they were the dominant trio, Shand, Pesner, and Jim. And they were not uncritical. Shand, about the 60s, I should think, I have frightful nightmares, and no wonder, for I'm haunted by a gnawing sense of guilt in having, in however minor degree, helped to bring about, anyhow encouraged, the embryo that has now materialized into a monster which neither of us could have foreseen. He was complaining about the drift into style as distinct from principle from the modern movement. Nicholas Pesner deplored the departure from the rectitude of the Bauhaus. He disliked intensely any suggestion of self-conscious expression. And he reserved one of his barbiest wires for one of my buildings and trying to think of the worst insult he could give it in a broadcast in the middle of the 60s, he says, I suppose it must be a postmodern building. <laughs> Jim, on the other hand, was writing his review of his edi editorship in a speech called The Hollow Victory at the RIBA. And like Pesner, he wanted anonymity, less self-conscious expression, and deplored the failure to develop a vernacular. He touched nerve ends as far as me and my colleagues were concerned, and we used to go into a corner and mutter under our breath, it's those three blind mice again having a go. <laughs> but within weeks, conviviality returned, and we had lovely meals with Jim and Kit eating boiled potatoes in their skins, pickled herrings, and horseradish sauce. Now this must have come from Finland, the home of the greatest hero in his life. And uh, it was Finland who gave him one of his greatest honors, the Chevalier Order of the White Rose. Now, I tried very quickly to sum up what I think was at the heart of Jim, so far as I'm concerned. And when I think of him, I think his deep interest was really in industrial buildings, textile mills, docks, warehouses, railway buildings, so on. He loved the unadorned geometry, spare logical use of materials, which is a hallmark of modernism, and wonderfully photographed, very tellingly photographed, by Eric de Murray. But his most lyrical writing, in some ways, was in Castles on the Ground, which he wrote in 1946. A prophetic celebration of suburbia, about people's participating in their environment, wishing to control it and not be bullied by planners or architects. He writes, the dog summoned from the shadowed porch, the cheerful tea table, the quiet between the passing car lights, there is the essence of the modern English domestic scene. And like Browning, he would have applauded Browning's words. No more great men, dear God, just raise the general level. <laughs> I celebrated with him and his friends in Joe Patrick's home, his 80th birthday. He loved his family. And there are touching pieces in his autobiography, The Unjust Fellow, 
which suggests because of his childhood and his authoritarian father, he was sometimes not able to express either his affection or his pain in the personal tragedies which actually he suffered. <coughs> he would have been so pleased to have seen Kit's recent exhibition of painting only about three weeks ago, wonderful paintings which he had always encouraged her to do. I would like to end by just again quoting Jim, this time writing about Wells Coates in a tribute in the review. He says, we are, <coughs> excuse me, we are the beneficiaries of his lifelong zeal. His real record lies in the vigorous growth of modernism to which he devoted all his power and passion. And you could say exactly that about Jim. Dear Kit, ladies and gentlemen, 1938 was the year of the Mars Group's exhibition in the new Burlington Galleries, the first major exhibition of the new architecture in this country. I remember, I'm only about 17 at the time I think, I remember being impressed, amused and excited by a serio-comic group photograph of some of the organisers of that marvellous exhibition those men of Mars. The picture included and featured Maxwell Fry uh, posing as an enthusiastic owl, a buccaneering Wells Coates, Serge Shemayev, polished, leaning sideways and appearing at least eight feet high, and looking little more than 12 years old, a 30-year-old J. M. Richards. Not Jim then, to me, only later, and as a friend, and still looking perennially young, could it possibly, for me, be other than J.M. then. That Mars exhibition, and coming out two years later, during the war, that J.M. Richards Penguin, an introduction to modern architecture, compact, beautifully written, jargon and cliché-free, inspired many, like myself, to wish to and to try to become architects. But J.M. Richards didn't just write a great and influential book, followed some years later by another, The Functional Tradition, with Eric de Marais' lovely photographs. And he wasn't just a memorably superb editor of the Architectural Review, nor just a serious and revered architectural correspondent for the Times. He intervened, too, and with success. He, more than any other single person, shamed by his personal intervention, the then LCC, in 1950, into abandoning having the design of all its housing in the hands of their valuer. See the banal, unlovely Woodbury Down, and transferring it into the hands of its architect, Robert Matthew, with Whitfield Lewis, my brother Michael, Colin Lucas, and other true architects, C. Roehampton. A little before this time, Moya and I were in the early stages of Churchill Gardens in Pimlico, and I met for the first time him, who I feared would be the formidable J.M. Richards. Superficially, although superficial is seldom a word I would foist upon him, Superficially, he started formidable, but quickly became amiably, entertainingly, and helpfully critical. These characteristics are evident, too, in his serious, yet some, sometimes hilarious autobiography. To me, as to so many others, he was a welcome critic and supporter. Only in more recent years, when we became neighbours just off the Fulham Road, did we get to know each other more closely, and J.M. became Jim. He, 
and the delicious kit where, for Philippa and myself, lovely friends, earnest and funny at the same time, they were so splendid together. Like, like many architects from my generation, I first came across the name of J.M. Richards uh, as the author of The Penguin, Introduction to Modern Architecture. I was, in fact, given a copy while still at school, and it influenced my decision to study architecture. In my first year at Cambridge, I acquired a copy of The Castles on the Ground, which had recently been published. I think John Piper's illustrations made more impression on me than the text. I found the choice of subject for someone who had written about modern architecture puzzling. And it was only much later that I reread and properly appreciated the book, which its author believed was his only one founded on original thinking. As a practicing architect in the 50s and 60s, I was a subscriber to the Architectural Review and I admired the wide cultural spectrum which it covered and the fac fact that it was read, unlike any of the other architectural magazines, by a considerable number of non-architects. I met JMR, as we called him in the office, for the first time in 1967, the year of the Six-Day War, when I applied for a job at the Review and was called for an interview. I remember sending two little books I'd published ahead of me and going in some trepidation because of his reputed severity and curtness. The interview was indeed short but also friendly. I was asked whether I knew the leading architects with whom I would be dealing, to which I answered, of course, in the affirmative. The job advertised had in fact already gone to Tim Rock, who had got there before me, but there was room for another part-time assistant editor, which suited me because it enabled me to continue with my practice and teaching. I was to edit the newly enlarged interior design section, and JMR gave me encouragement from the start by enlarging the scope of the section to include historical, di uh, historical dimension. I remember researching Tarnay furniture on the occasion of an exhibition and writing a leng lengthy article before Tarnay furniture became fashionable to write about. In those early days, I never found Jim remote and unapproachable, and not in the least the withdrawn and rather daunting figure which some people considered him, himself, considered him to be. When I joined the review, Nicholas Taylor had just left and Peter Bannum had been gone some three years, having been appointed to a chair at the Bartlett. Gordon Cullen had also left, but Townscape continued to be championed in most issues by Kenneth Brown. And Ian, uh, Ian Nairn's outrage feature appeared regularly as a two-page stop press insert. These were the last years of the Review's continuous campaign throughout the 50s and 60s on behalf of environmental improvement. In addition to the latest architecture, the Review at this time also included articles on architectural history and theory, picture features, and gallery, which was a monthly review of art galleries or exhibitions in art galleries, brilliantly written by Robert Melville, who I think was recruited by Jim. Two qualities stood out for me in the review. All these different subjects were not segregated and compartmentalized. They would inform each other. A historical dimension, for example, permeated all of them. The other quality was the review's internationalism. 
There was absolutely nothing insular or narrow about the review. <coughs> now, much of this was due to Jim, who was a man of discerning taste and very wide culture. <coughs> the editorial board, which met every Monday morning, consisted at that time of the eccentric and brilliant proprietor already mentioned, uh, Hubert de Kronin Hastings, Nicholas Pevsner, Hugh Casson, and Jim Richards. A few months after joining the review, Jim asked me to take on World, which was the monthly miscellany of international projects started by Peter Bannon some years before. In this, I benefited greatly from his many connections all over the world, some of whom, like Georgina Masson, Hilda Selim, and Marina Haidopoulou Adams, who is here tonight, were also the review's correspondents. Jim's enthusiasm for the international scene and travel stimulated my own like enthusiasm and helped me maintain, I think, the international flavor of the review after his retirement. His very special interest in Venice, an interest which was not just historical, but in the future of Venice as, as a living city, uh, culminated in the special issue of May 1971, just before Jim retired, and prompted me to write a series of follow-up articles. Jim was a member of the Venice Imperial Fund from the very beginning, and I'm told his contributions there were always to the point and professionally so much more authoritative than those of any other member of the committee. Jim's interest in and love of the Middle East and the fascinating articles on Jeddah and Ha'il, which he published in the review soon after the war, inspired me and led to the features which I published in the 70s on Aleppo, Cairo, and Isfahan, all cities which Jim had known in the war. Near a home, he isn't Eric de Marie's functional tradition in early industrial buildings, originally a special issue of the view, led at his suggestion to my new uses for old buildings, also first published as a special issue, which showed some of the same examples converted and examined the whole problem of converting worthwhile redundant buildings. Jim had always written in the review about both old and new buildings. He had battled successfully against the demolition of Carlton House Terrace and unsuccessfully against the demolition of the Adelphi. He, uh, he had been in on the founding of the Georgian Group in 1938 and of the Victorian Society in 1958. He had struggled in vain to save the Euston Arch and he had, with the incomparable help of Nicholas Pevsner, greatly extended the review's coverage of architectural history. Yet, like Pevsner, he retained his belief that the principles of the modern movement in architecture remained absolutely valid today. <clears throat> Although I am critical of some of the results in practice, he wrote, I am not going back on what I have stood for. Nowhere was he more more critical of results than in his devastating article, Failure for New Towns, published in the review in July 1953. Good design by individual architects, he wrote, does not alter the fact that their failure as a body to give society a lead and impose on it the ideas their knowledge and technical responses tell them are the best ideas, is the failure of modern architecture itself a failure the more disastrous for having occurred on the occasion when architecture faced the challenge of fulfilling a vital social need. It will be a long time before such an opportunity comes architecture's way again. Some two years before my joining the review, Jim had been to Romania, and when in 1969 the Romanian government again invited him, he proposed that I should go instead. The invitation came eventually, and I was able to visit my native country after an absence of 32 years. I had been to East Germany the year before, and this is probably the place 
to mention politics. I had heard of Jim's left-wing sympathies, but I never once saw any evidence of them. On the contrary, I got the impression he held the autocratic regimes of Eastern Europe in the contempt that they deserved. I cannot conclude without mentioning the Royal Fine Art Commission, on which Jim served from 1951 to 1966. On the principle of better the devil you know, he was appointed after writing a magisterial leader in the review, criticizing the Commission's repeated failure to set a lead about architecture to the public, or make prompt and vigorous criticisms of the designs that came before it. After criticizing the new ocean terminal at Southampton for being utterly unworthy of its important situation, he goes on to lambast the Commission for approving its, its designs. The Royal Fine Art Commission was founded in response to a long sustained protest by the responsible and visually literate public against the system by which accomplished facts are thrust on the public without their previous approval or consent. The reverse of the democratic principle, the aesthetic equivalent of taxation without representation. It was realized at the time that a watchdog that quietly and with the utmost diplomacy ignored the arrival of the fox in the interest of a quiet life on the farm, or a watchdog that gently took the farmer by the trouser leg when he emerged with his shotgun to protect the new roosts, was no watchdog at all, that on the contrary he was an ally of the fox, and that unless the newly formed commission accepted its responsibility, responsibilities courageously, unless it acted as a spokesman on behalf of the public, <coughs> it would not only do little good, but would serve to use yet another metaphor as a fig leaf with which to cover up the shame of the very authorities whose private acts it was designed to expose in the public interest. He wrote, uh, Jim wrote in Memoirs of Nanjas Fella, that he feared his membership had not led to much improvement. The book appeared in 1980, and I would like to think that had it appeared ten years later, he would not have written these words. Things, I think, have improved in the sense that he meant it. Criticism has become more vigorous, while poor designs are never accepted, let alone approved. The Commission now sets a lead about architecture to the public, as it did recently in the case of the Inland Revenue Offices at, at Nottingham. After I left the review, I regularly met and conferred with Jim. He came to have lunch with me at the Commission only a month or so before his death. He remained the best possible councillor and friend to the end. My memories, recollections of Jim, basically childhood memories. I, we first knew Jim when I was about seven years old in 1958. And the fact that I've gone on to become an architect is uh, really coincidence because all my connections with him have been personal and family connections. And really, the, it was a series, for several years, we went on holiday with the Richards. And there were very many happy family holidays, mainly at the idyllic cottage at Aldington in Kent and also holidays abroad, mainly in France. And I think for us children, and that includes my sister Alexandra, and my brother Mark, um, who are also here tonight, that their cottage was the second house for us, and until we had a cottage of our own, we called it the cottage, and it was uh, part of our family life, and we spent every holiday, and many weekends there, sometimes as a family or sometimes individually. It was a perfect place. It, you can see pictures of it in the exhibition over there. It's a thatched, half-timbered cottage with barns, a stream, an orchard, weeping willow trees, wild fennel plants, pampas grass, a fruit cage which always had a, a bloated sparrow inside it, and sh sheep grazing the surrounding fields. And I suppose we children were also there during the 50s and 60s when Jim was all-powerful at the Architectural Review, when the guests were... Pipers, Trevelyans, Penroses, Lasdens, and many other people when they came to stay with Kit and Jim at the cottage. And at the time, I suppose I was oblivious as to who they were, but uh, and our contributions to this select company were probably
practical jokes or unwelcome interruptions when we fell out of bikes or fell out of trees or off bikes. And that we were also there at the architectural press at Queen Anne's Gate, but only after hours, playing hide and seek amongst the passageways and stairs with its confusing and very surprising mirrors. And then we afterwards we'd have, uh, when Jim had finished his work, we'd have lemonade in the Bride of Denmark downstairs. We became friend friendly with Jim and Kit through their son Alexander at Chelsea Open Air Nursery School. And he was younger than my sister Alexandra and myself, but older than my brother Mark. And from that initial friendship in the cloakrooms of the nursery school, Jim and Kit became extremely close friends, really an extension of our family. Alexander was another, another brother to, to uh, Alexandra, Mark and myself. And uh, Jim and Kit were sort of uncle and aunt. And there was no contrivance about the, the setup. We were, we were very close families. I can remember very clearly the first time we met Jim. And uh, th this image s still sticks with me, in th that there's a very curious contrast of a very formally dressed man, almost sort of Edwardian figure. I didn't actually notice his socks until later. But, and he lived, they lived in this sort of bohemian Chelsea bedsit flat. And I remember that he was almost shy, which is something that you probably see as a, as a child and uh, probably sense as a seven-year-old more than you would uh, when you were older. But he, he, on the introduction, he was almost shy. And I always felt that a lot of his seeming gruffness was a sort of shyness. And I, I think that flat really made, always made a distinct visual impression on us. And it was a bit like a railway carriage. It was a linear flat. And their bed was in the middle of the living room. It was surrounded by beautiful objects with Japanese prints, the coronation mugs, bust of Queen Victoria, and fantastic prints and uh, pictures on the walls, a lot, a lot of Kit's uh, beautiful intricate paintings, uh, a Henry Moore um, sketch which had been given to them on their, their wedding out of his sketchbook, John Piper's, Edward Lear watercolours, and uh, Ben Nicholson's. And, um, the main thing about the flat was the wonderful view of the river. It was on the bend in the river just by Battersea Bridge, and there's a vine on the balcony which always produced small grapes which tasted as soot. He, he was um, a slightly frightening figure in a way and quite um, reserved, but very kindly. And um, he was also curiously formal with Alexander, but clearly extremely devoted and proud of him. He, he used to call Alexander little boy, and uh, Alexander used to call him father which always struck us as strange, but it was uh, perhaps something of, um, of, of, his, of his own upbringing which um, cre created this formal formality. And my sister reminded me the other day that when she went to stay with Kit and Jim at the Penroses, she had no qualms about putting Holly down the Roland Penrose's side of the bed for, for them to find when they went to sleep, but they definitely put the Holly down Kit's side of the bed and, and not Jim's. <laughs> In, in when, many ways, uh, my impression was that Jim lived a life of a, 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 almost, as I said before, an Edwardian gentleman once he left a, his bohemian Chelsea flat. He never needed to drive and never learnt to. And in London, he'd go by bus and taxi between Chelsea, Queen Anne's Gate, and the Athenaeum or Beefsteak Truck Club. And I can remember greeting him outside the Athenaeum, and I realised in light of other stories how honoured I was that he, he returned a friendly greeting to me, because he was always very reserved in public on trains or in meeting people in the street, but I, I, I didn't realise this at the time. And when other um, aspect of his uh, sort of Edwardian um, uh, upbringing was that when, if you had lunch with him and you ordered soup in a restaurant, and this is recorded in, in his autobiography, he, he would always say that he, he would never have soup at lunchtime because there were three things that his father had taught him which were never order soup at lunchtime, never wax your moustache, and never hunt south of the River Thames. And this was... <laughs> <laughs> and he still adhered to all those, um, all those precepts. As for getting, getting to, the, to the cottage, Kit would always drive, and I remember these wintertime trips in the car with them. It was appropriately called a Hillman Husky, and they had about four Hillman Huskies, one after another, without heaters. And Jim was always cleaning the windscreen with a neatly folded hang handkerchief. And being a, a, a true non-driver, I always felt he, he cleaned his side of the window for the, to get the view much better than Kit's. But he was uh, also on holiday. We, we would go down to the beach, and swimming was something of a speciality. He, he was one of the main proponents of a, 
what I think was now an unf well, what is now clearly an unfashionable stroke, the trudgeon, which was some um, sort of sedate side stroke that uh, Captain Webb used to uh, swim the channel. <laughs> and um, he, he continuously tried to get carried on uh, uh, swimming the trudgeon and tried to teach my sister the, the stroke. I'm not sure how successfully. But I'm not aware that there's ever been a 100 meters trudgeon event to, <laughs> at the Olympics. As for expeditions on holidays, uh, I soon became used to the sort of architect's world where you, the, the expeditions aren't normal walks. You sort of arm with a guidebook and an indistinct map and you go to the end of the tube line and then maybe you walk another 45 minutes and get slightly lost in the search of some architectural milestone. Now we, I remember quite clearly in northern France one such walk where we were walking for hours and hours with us children armed with kites and things and eventually we realized things had gone terribly wrong as we were ankle deep in animal bones and uh, horses skulls and uh, he, I think even then he admitted that he, he'd gone wrong. We, we never did work out where he was heading for but he'd always, he'd always take command and, um, uh, and uh, lead us off in, on these bizarre expeditions. Um, he was a great great traveler and um, he taught us a, a lot about foreign travel and um, and he was particularly concerned that we uh, we participated in, in everything in th that was part of the country and I can remember him being quite indignant in France when the hotel we were staying at re served the rest of the restaurant snails and gave us in English people something else which was far more innocuous and he, he he complained bitterly to the management and uh, th thereafter we had given every, all the, only the most authentic French food. But, um, as has been said before, he wasn't uh, 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 a great cook and I seem to remember his main contribution to dinner parties was that he boasted that he'd moved the camembert around the house and to find the right temperature to, to ensure that it had ripen, ripened at the, at the right moment. Um, on the other hand, he did uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically once cook a a meal in, in Kent, uh, which was a very pungent fish soup, and uh, he uh, afterwards he put all the shells out of the, the back, and we had every cat in the surrounding area <laughs> screaming at our, our back door. Um, I remember he, he used to inflict on poor old Kit the um, hazards of inviting Elizabeth David, who he knew in the in the Middle East, <laughs> round to r round to dinner and uh, encourage Kit to make scrambled eggs, but make it quite well. And uh, I, I think that's what actually happened. And I thought it was quite an innovative solution. His, his travels and his in introductions, he, w he was incredibly generous with his uh, introductions to people. And we owe qu uh, a lot to him. We had um, several happy holidays. Penny, my wife, and my, myself had several very happy holidays in Rome when uh, he, he put us in contact with Babs Johnson, better known as Georgina Masson, to dog sit for, for her. And uh, there was always an interesting tension between uh, Jim and, and, and Babs Johnson going back to their days in the, in the, in the Middle East. And one had a sense of a world that, that um, were very exciting times of uh, several years before. Also when, when Penny went off to, to Finland to work in her, in her year out, he much to everyone's amazement, he gave her a copy of his book, and I don't think he ever gave anyone the copies of his books. And this young architecture student was, was given a copy of the book and contacts of the architecture museum. And then in, in Venice, perhaps a more, a more tragic note, where once when I was a student here at the AA, I was going on a trip around Europe, and knowing that my money would run out, I went to meet my parents, who were going to go on holiday with Kit and Jim in, in Venice. And um, wh when I got there, I found an envelope with the shattering news that Alexander, their son, had been killed in a road accident and, um, and their holiday had been cancelled. But Jim, quite um, uh, characteristically, had, in, despite his immense grief, had also had the presence of mind to contact the um, British consul in, in Venice and, uh, and I got another letter saying that Mr. Richards had instructed the British consul to make contact with me to see if I was all right. So he, even in the, the moments of his greatest grief, he still had a great presence of mind and great thoughtfulness. I always find, found him a great help in my, in, in general, in personal advice for 
when, when I decided to start on a career in architecture. And um, we, we never overlapped as, uh, as architects. We never really discussed buildings, but he, he would always have very, very useful um, uh, advice. He, he encouraged me to go to the AA when other people were saying that you'd get a much better technical education at the Barclays and the AA was about to close and it was, um, and it was uh, in, a, in a crisis. He said it's always, always like that. So, and, uh, you, <laughs> you, you, might as well, you might as well carry on. And he, he was quite right and, and it's still in crisis. <laughs> And um, then when I did my year out, I, I worked in an office in, in Chile, and um, he encouraged me to go to Chile. And I think looking back at his time when he left the AA and went to the States in the middle of the Depression, and uh, the conventional wisdom was that one should get a respectable job in an office in London as the first step in a career over here, but I, I, I was determined to go, and he, he, he encouraged me. And I can remember when I, when I was there, and it was a time of great hardship when the uh, the last year of the IND government and there were shortages of, of everything and most packages that came from London had uh, razor blades or um, films for cameras and one day I got a, a package from, um, from J Jim and Kit and in it were six copies of Private Eye magazine and Jim <laughs> felt that, that, this would be the th that this would be the thing that I'd be most in need of is some British sense of humour and he was quite right in a way it's one of those things that one, one misses when one's, when one's abroad and uh, he w certainly wasn't going to send me anything more use useful like razor blades or film. And really the last memory of Jim was uh, again last, last year on, on holiday. And um, he, uh, he they, they, Jim and Kit were staying at Sestri Levante. And uh, we, we have our own house in Holiday House in Italy, which we think is every bit as idyllic as their cottage that we remember from years ago. And I had this image of... Uh, Jim, when we collected him to take him up to our house at Pontremoli, where they were, where he was in the Grand Hotel Villa Balbi, which is a really opulent Ligurian villa between the two bays at Sestri, which had been converted into a, into a hotel. And I, I have this the, this wonderful image of Jim, happy on holiday, um, travelling in great style, in a, again in an almost Edwardian style. Thank you. Richard job, I think. Uh, well, the first thing I'd like to say is uh, that uh, my old pal Gordon Cullen has asked me to um, say uh, that he's with us in spirit tonight. He couldn't come here. Poor chap had a bad stroke about a year ago, but uh, you see, he was one of our gang at the Architectural Press with Jim Richards, and he should have been saying a few words tonight, but unfortunately he couldn't be here. Um, well, Jim Richards, now, he was a pretty important chap in my life. And I remember I met him at a party at Hammersmith, I think it was, uh, well over 40 years ago, I should think. And when our hostess introduced us, he said, Oh, yes, we're old enemies. <laughs> he said. And uh, I gave the appropriate giggle. And uh, in fact, I felt rather flattered because even at that time he had some reputation. Um, and uh, it may be. Uh, you know, I, I was t a bit taken aback, but um, it, it may be he saw me as a potential professional rival. In fact, we never were rivals, and uh, through the years we became very good friends. Perhaps not intimately so, because he was a very shy man, I think, you know, underneath. Um, but I think we even managed to achieve a certain uh, half-expressed affection for each other. Um, 
Um, and at one point, uh, a sort of traumatic moment in both our lives was when his young son was killed in an accident and my wife died of cancer. Uh, we did come together with some um, sympathy and warmth. He, wa he was a very warm man underneath that rather austere front, I think. Um, but I think ours really was a, essentially a working relationship. And um, there we were in complete accord with one another. We didn't talk much, but um, we always saw eye to eye. We didn't need to talk, really. Um, and I was very, very grateful to him as a struggling freelance because he gave me a lot of commissions as an editor of the Architectural Review. Um, um, and I think more than any other jobs I've ever done, I enjoyed working for Jim on the, on the review. Um, for one thing, they always showed one's pictures uh, to good advantage. They were well reproduced and they were never cropped. <laughs> A crime which I, I detest, you know, and happens too often in, in picture magazines. Um, the pay was rotten, really. <laughs> Shocking pay. <laughs> but uh, it was a joy to have one's best pictorial efforts reproduced uh, so beautifully. Um, the biggest job I did for Jim was to tour the whole of England one summer, one of the wettest on records, I think it must have been. Um, to search for and to photograph anonymous and unrecognized buildings of the early decades of the Industrial Revolution. It was one of the uh, most marvelous jobs I ever had, uh, most fascinating journey of exploration, discovery, and revelation. It led to a special issue of the review and then a joint book, which you can see in there. Um, perhaps it didn't achieve vast sales, but I think it did achieve certain success of esteem. I don't think Jim really ever had any small talk. And um, I don't know if he had any big talk either. <laughs> <laughs> except on his special subject. I mean, one couldn't, for instance, expect to settle down with him over a bottle of vodka and, and talk into the small hours about the meaning of meaning and is there such a thing as free will and why does anything exist so miraculously? And... Um, the metaphysical mysteries, what is consciousness, all that kind of thing. Um, I think, not without reason, Jim would have considered this to be a cerebral occupation that was both self-indulgent and utterly futile. <laughs> I think he was probably right. But, but it's fun. That kind of discussion, to me anyway, I enjoy it. Um, apart from our both being um, AA and AP alma mater, martyrs, we had something else in common. Our Protestant Puritan background and inheritance. Not that Jim had any religion, I don't think, in the orthodox sense. Um, in fact, um, John Betjeman used to say, um, 
always called him Karl Marx, which I think <laughs> came to irritate him. Right. <laughs> no. And I don't blame him being irritated. As for myself, as the man said, I'm an atheist, thank God. <laughs> um, but, you see, the trouble is we suck in this uh, ancestral mythology with our mother's milk. And it's very difficult to get rid of it. Uh, I deplore it, you know. I really do. The Puritan tradition, I believe, really, uh, quite seriously, that if you look into it, Calvinism uh, has been largely responsible for the horrors of the modern world. <laughs> a very good argument in Tawny's religion and the rise of capitalism on that matter. Um, not least, I think, it's responsible for what uh, Lewis Mumford called our uh, urbanoid mishmash. Our uh, urbanoid mishmash, yes. Uh, I think there was a great deal of this ailment in the modern movement, you know, in architecture, um, which Jim so strongly supported, and in the 30s, and which I did too at the time. Um, I've come over to the Victorianism since then. At least it's got a bit of decoration, isn't it? Um, but, you see, Puritanism, it has its good side. It tends to produce individuals like Jim who have self-reliance, integrity, dedication, and a most conscientious craftsmanship. He did have these virtues, Jim, and in a very high degree. Um, he was a most competent editor, a valuable man on numerous committees and a prolific writer. I noticed about 30 books he wrote, you know. Um, and he expressed himself clearly, honestly, and without any of those obscurantist affectations which too many critics of the arts are guilty. I know only too well as an erstwhile editor the agony of having to fill at a creed space by spinning out a few words when you really have at the time nothing much to say. But Jim always had something intelligible to say. And he was a very wise man too, I think. He wrote somewhere, I can't remember where exactly, some words with which I heartily agree and with which architects should sometimes remove their blinkers to consider. Words to the effect that the solutions to the architectural and planning problems of our times are not primarily of an architectural or planning nature at all, but they're much wider and deeper. I think small things can tell you a lot about a person. Take Jim's desk in his office at the dear old Queen Anne's Gate. I remember a drawing in Punch which showed a tiny solicitor behind a huge desk piled high with papers, some of them spilling onto the floor. Um, and the man was frantically hurling some of these papers into the air. And the caption read, and then, of course, there'll be the usual search fee. <laughs> <laughs> but Jim's desk wasn't like that at all. Every evening when he went home, his top was entirely free of papers, and everything had been neatly and methodically filed away in its proper place. It's possible, you know, that behind that rather austere front of his, there lurked quite a sensitive romantic. His love of London was perhaps an expression of that. 
and it's one I can understand as an old Londoner myself, but I've lost a lot of my love of London, and charm vanished for me when they took away those beautiful, effulgent, and poetic pea supers. <laughs> Well, there have been some lovely poems written about them, haven't there? Dickens called them London Particulars, isn't it? London Particulars. They belong to my childhood and my youth. Uh, we had an important um, phrase, an aesthetic phrase in the 30s, significant form. Some of you probably remember that. Um, and of course there's form follows function, slogans like that. Jim would have known that phrase very well. And as a personality, he himself possessed significant form. I read lately in some autobiography, I can't remember what it was, of a small boy pointing to an impressive figure standing on edge of the pavement and it was asking mummy what's that man for <laughs> Sir James Richards knew precisely what he was for and so do we he achieved his accolade and it was fully deserved I think we do very well to recognize his worth and to honor his memory here tonight. I first knew Jim before I knew John, and that was a very, very long time ago. I had the pleasure of introducing them, and when I said to Jim, I've just met an artist whom I like very much. Hmm, I said, what's he called? So I said, John Piper. He said, never heard of him. Where does he live? I said, St. Peter's Square. Hmm, can't be any good, he said. But that um, was typical of Jim, just not to allow him. Not, not, Sorry. not answering. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it was typical of him to be very careful not to ensue too soon. Uh, but I got to know him uh, very well after that. Um, I was going to talk, I thought, about one of what I think was his most original and most unlikely works, which has already been mentioned several times, Castles on the Ground, An Anatomy of Suburbia. I thought I'd talk about it because I knew that all his other many skills and interests would have been discussed and far better than I possibly could. And I thought that I had got a little uh, something to say about it because when I was wondering why on earth he'd done it, what induced him to talk about suburbia, suburbia if you please, which is something that uh, was despised looked down upon, uh, writing a careful, humane book about such a subject is, seemed very strange. Something that was being patronized, laughed at, run down, 
as a mere setting for cornflakes and garden mowers by all the light-minded people, right-minded people, poets and all. But I found out in some letters that he wrote uh, to us from Cairo just a little bit of why he did do this subject. <clears throat> he was in Cairo where he was working during the war in the Ministry of Information. And he wrote to us, I've been reading Hardy, who goes down well or in this distance, uh, at this distance from the smell of Wessex weather and a lot else. It's been good for me to think of uh, a certain amount about architecture without having to do anything about it. Lately, I've started writing tentatively. I've started rather tentatively to write a little and I am fascinated to find that I have become rather reactionary and old-fashioned about such things as planning and individualism. In March, he wrote, you ask for me what it is that I'm writing. I would like to tell you, but I find it difficult to explain in a letter. I had done no writing since leaving England until last summer when I felt myself moved to write a book about ordinary architecture and the genuine qualities it has as, dis it has as distinct from architect's architecture. It is really a demonstration of the virtues and the, uh, the virtues and the individualities of places like the suburbs where people take their architecture it unselfconsciously and an assault against the people who want to impose genteel good taste. He had sent this writing to Pevsner, who was working at the Ar Archie Review and threw him, of course, to de Cronin, Hastings, wanting to get a reaction, just to make sure, he went on, that I wasn't writing utter nonsense, even seemed so remote in that, in that understated phrase. We sensed his loneliness and frustration in spite of hot sun, comparative luxury, many agreeable new, friend, old, new and old friends and a certain amount of interesting travel. I thought it quite possible, he went on, that I had invented everything I was writing that everything I was writing is gospel truth. De Cronin sent it back in his usual, with, with his usual penetrating, uncompromising, and occasionally perverse comments. I'm trying to find time to revise it and write some more. De Cronin Hastings was, was a perpetual source of entertainment, legend, exasperation, <coughs> and jokes, as everyone who knew anyone who had worked in the Archie knew, uh, uh, knows. After Jim came back, he set about to finish Castles on the Ground and getting it published. A nice example of his, uh, of his uh, throwaway sense of humour came in a letter in June, after John had gone to see him to discuss the illustrations, which were going to be lithographs done by the Bernard Press. I look forward to hearing how, uh, how Bernard's visit went down. And then he went on. De Cronin is well. He rushed off to hospital because he'd found something in his throat. They told him it was his uvula. <laughs> well, I was going to go on to read something from the book, but I think that it's not really necessary. And everyone who knows Jim, I'm sure, is, if they haven't read it, will read it, because it's, it contains some of his most humane and most interesting comments on, not only on life, but architecture and, and the complications of trying to judge it.
that, that concludes the, the speaking for today and if you'd like to um, gradually make your way up um, to watch the in quotes, surprise. Um, I've been asked to tell you there are various places uh, you can watch it from. Those who don't want to go up the stairs, there's um, a certain amount of room in reception on the ground floor and you can look through the windows. Uh, you can also watch from the back members room up on the first floor or you can go up to the second floor and go out onto the terrace um, above the back members room. Um, in, in about 15 minutes we'll start, so there's a bit of time to, 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 to chat and drift around and even to look at the exhibition if you, if you like to. And the uh, surprise will conclude the um, formal um, uh, business tonight, uh, but uh, for those who'd like to stay on a bit, uh, the, the bar uh, will be open. And I think we must all thank the, um, everyone at the um, AA for what they've done to make this evening uh, possible uh, and enjoyable and interesting. Did I, did I, I forget if I, if I said at the beginning that the surprise is due uh, um, to the generosity of the proprietors of the architectural review. Mm -hmm.